Right, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to share with you an idea that I believe works very well. And I think just to start out and to share with you where I am and where I'm based, I work for the NCPC, the National Cleaner Production Center. The National Cleaner Production Center is a program of DTI. We are hosted by the CSR and we're located within uh, the implementations unit. The presentation will cover essentially some baseline. It will set the base case for what the IEE project was all about. I will talk to you about the project baseline and the particular focus of the IEE project. And then we're going to go into some of the outputs. And the outputs are merely the numbers in terms of what we've achieved. Emanating from the IEE project, we had some fundamental and interesting and some unintended consequences. I will share with you just two of those. And we're going to look at behavioral insights and socioeconomic impacts. And the lessons learned from both of those during the five-year project. We're going to wrap up and we're going to reflect on the sustainability failures that are common and what we've seen happen in the South African industrial landscape. And we're going to look at and identify the winning culture that had become a clear recipe for what has happened in our country and has manifested in similar projects in both Europe and America. I think I need to start off by just talking about the stakeholders. The IEE project was launched in South Africa in 2010. It was the first of its kind in the world. And it was an imperative driven by what was clearly a paradigm change to the way we had perceived electricity and energy in South Africa during the 2008 power outages. The IEE project is funded and the stakeholders that covered both funding and drive the management of the project included the DTI and the DOE. They were instrumental largely in a large portion of the funding, of the in-kind funding. We had the Swiss government through SECO and the British government through the UK aid that contributed quite strongly to the project and the United Nations Industrial Development Organization fulfilled the role of implementing agent during the five years of the project. It's important to state that the National Cleaner Production Center was the custodian of the IEE project and the National Production Center is hosted by the CSR. It is interesting that even at this late stage of our lives, we still have some very vocal detractors of climate change and CO2 emissions or the impact of CO2 on climate change. And in flying up from Cape Town in one of the latest issues of engineering news, in an opinion article by a nuclear physicist, I read about his attack or his concerns about the flimsy link between CO2 emissions and climate change. Amongst others, he claimed that the model that developed this two degrees Celsius target for globe, average global temperature increase was flawed and was probably 50% accurate. He also claimed that the pre-medieval uh, warming period or phase in our history was certainly warmer than what we're experiencing now. Well, let me share with you what clearly we have learned from reputable and certainly independent sources about those factors. If we look at just the this slide over there, that is what we were doing and that was business as usual and we clearly cannot continue business as usual. We cannot continue to consume and produce as if there's no end and there's a limitless pit of both resources of energy and the ability to sustain those emissions that we derive. We have independent sources that are highlighted and identified and correlated the temperature rise and we started gathering average global temperatures from about 1880. And over about a 135 year period, we've marked and recorded 0.8 degrees Celsius increase in average global temperature. 80% of that increase in global temperature was since 1975. If we look at the 12 hottest years in history, 11 of those were post 2000. So we are clearly seeing the impact and the effects of CO2 emissions in terms of global temperature. And the impact of global temperature in terms of the percentage of water vapor being held above the, the oceans and in, in the atmosphere above. If we come to this particular slide over here, I want to just point out that we've seen, the, the, we've seen a plethora of scenarios developed to combat that. Amongst others, we had the um, World Energy Outlook, a publication of the International Energy Agency, identify scenarios of 350, 450, and 550 parts per million. And if we consider that just the 450 parts per million scenario of seeking to achieve that by 2030, as we've heard earlier, and as is reported, we are fast approaching or may have exceeded the 450 parts per million case already. We've seen energy technology perspectives develop the 2010 analysis that seeks to drive the reduction through to 2050. 
But IEA has developed what we call the blue line or the blue map emissions. And the blue map emissions seeks to reduce what we saw in 2010 as 20, an absolute emission of 28 gigatons of CO2e and reduce that by 50% or rather 14 gigaton of CO2e by 2050. Those are the targets. And if we continue to consume and produce this and, 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 and maintain that level of, of, of production and consumption, we are likely to see a level of nearing or approximately 57 giga, uh, gigatons of CO2e by 2050. Scenarios developed to counter that are wide and various, and they include quite a few technologies. But fundamental to that are these that account for about 58% of that, which is end-use fuel switching and energy efficiency programs. The American Council for an Energy Efficient Environment developed and quantified the new levelized cost of new electricity resources, and it ranged from biomass through to pulverized coal, wind, and nuclear energy from about 80 cents a kilowatt hour to about 110 cents a kilowatt hour. Set that against the cost of energy efficiency at about 36 cents per kilowatt hour. It starts to make a compelling argument about the need to drive the change through energy efficiency in industry. Professor Anton Eberhardt, part of the ESCOM war room, presented this at a breakfast meeting earlier this year. And there's some astounding warnings of where we're heading to in terms of our generation of electricity in this country. He talks about the worst power crisis in 40 years and the fact that these are likely to persist for another five years. He looks at the 87 coal generating units and identified 32 of those requiring major surgery and three in dire conditions. So as despite the expectation of Madupi and Kusile coming on stream, in fact, the first unit at Madupi, the first 800 megawatt unit, a slightly less than 800 megawatt unit, came on stream on the 23rd of August 2015, some three years later than planned and scheduled. And ultimately, Madupi is now scheduled to come on stream in its entirety in uh, about 2019. Kusila, that's rated as one of the fourth largest power, coal power plants in the world, will see its first unit come on stream in late 2017, some one year later than scheduled. So, Despite expectations that we are likely to see an increase in the availability of the power plants at ESCOM, it is more likely because of the delays that we are seeing at, at Kusila and Madupi, and also the maintenance challenges that the current fleet poses, that we are likely to see that the risk is that ESCOM will ultimately see a plant availability fall to about 70% by 2017. Now that's quite significant in terms of where we are. Aside of that context, there's one about the industry. And when we embarked on the IE project in South Africa, we encountered a mindset that in many ways presented some of the biggest challenges. The focus was essentially still on making money and producing as opposed to energy. And it's only recently that we're starting to see the, the language change within industry from purely producing tons of product, but starting to talk about energy intensity numbers or energy performance indicators, such as gigawatt hours per ton or, or kilowatt hours per, uh, uh, per product. Lack of information and understanding of financial qualitative benefits exist, and that is evident in how CapEx projects for energy efficiency is sidelined and seldom see the light of day. Lack of adequate technical skills within companies, and that is where the IE project addressed that need very strongly through the training that we conducted and vocational capacitating of plant engineers, plant technicians, and, 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 and site managers. Inadequate monitoring systems. I met with the, the, the management team of a very large pulp and paper plant in South Africa recently. And when I shared with them the outcomes of our work with them and how it could have been so much better had we had an improved metering and monitoring system on site, he bemoaned the fact that it would cost millions upon millions to do that. And really, you don't need to do a blanket metering. If you, if you can develop some of the energy and, 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 and mass balance understandings with flows, you can develop some in good, pretty accurate indication of flows and consumption within plants and do that, and be more selective about how you use submetering. Where energy efficiency knowledge exists, unfortunately, we find at times it resides within one or two individuals in the plant. And we have seen how very large groups have lost energy, group energy managers and revert virtually to P 
plan A and start right from scratch in developing the programs again. So we see a lot of that and we see quite a lot of that defensiveness as well. The IE project is a global program. In 2010, we were blessed in South Africa in that we were the first to do that. We were the first not only to launch the IE project globally, but we were the only uh, country, and still is today, that have developed and launched the IEE project in its full service, bouquet of services, as we have done in South Africa. Um, the, today, the program is operational in, in 17 countries, so 16 other besides South Africa. And, we, and a lot of the lessons learned and gained in developing this project in South Africa is being applied. I'm very proud as national project manager to say that we are now starting to see the export of that that capacitation that was developed since 2010 now being applied in other countries. We're seeing South Africans go out to the other nations on that list, conducting training and supporting assessment initiatives by UNIDO. The technology focus of the IEE project essentially stems two fundamental philosophies. One is the energy management system. And the energy management systems forms the basis of how we engage and integrate energy management systems into companies. We look at what is there already. We try not to replicate. We try not to duplicate. We try and integrate what we have within environmental systems and or other world-class manufacturing structures within those companies. And there's essentially three phases in that. We have what we call the management phase, the planning phase, and the day-to-day -day operations. In the planning phase, we conduct the energy review. And we only proceed with the energy management system when we have top management commitment manifested by a signed policy and management review and a commitment to support and be visible and to demonstrate the interest and support for the project. Beyond that, in the, in the planning stage, we conduct energy reviews. And the energy review is fundamental to how we change the scope of optimizing systems. Prior to 2010 and largely through the effect of component salesmen, we've seen the focus very much on components. They would look at a motor, a pump, a VSD, a fan, a control system, instead of looking at the system as a whole. So one of the first paradigm shifts was to extend the, the envelope and look at the system as a whole. And in this particular case, where we look at the steam system, we had both generation, distribution, end use, and recovery. And in optimizing the systems, we were, we were able to identify and unlock far greater levels of savings within businesses. Some of the project outcomes. Over the five-year period, the project engaged 384 companies. Engagement means training, training on-site, training within our, within our facilities. It means conducting assessments, providing technical support to, 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 to project manage retrofits and develop case studies. Largely SMEs, but some large and very large organizations too. Of those 388, 384, we developed demonstration plants. Demonstration plants effectively allow us to come in and capture and support the outcomes of implementation products, projects that they've undertaken. Of the 77, we developed case studies, and those 35 case studies form the basis for some of the work that I share with you today. Energy management systems was by far and large the single biggest contributor to savings in the IEE project. Savings achieved, and these are actual savings from implementation products, uh, projects undertaken subsequent to our energy systems optimization assessments and the development of action plans in energy management systems. We've seen savings arise, and these savings are um, reported and verified through M&V protocols. We've seen savings um, totaling 1,3 terawatt hours over that five-year period. That is equivalent, and if you, if, you, if you fail to grasp the magnitude of that, it's equivalent to powering up 186,000 middle-income South African homes for 12 months. CO2 emission savings of 1.2 million tons, and a rand savings of 1.1 billion. The 1.1 billion rand savings was achieved with payback significantly less than two years, except for one project. It was a, it was a strategic implementation of a, of a of a twin regenerative vertical shaft kiln at a plant in the Northern Cape. All the other projects were significantly less than two years. Undertaking those numbers and achieving those is good, but it's incomplete when you do not consider the impact that you've made on society or within industry as a whole. So what we did against a baseline that may not have been very clearly defined at the start of the project in 2010 
we looked at those 35 case studies and we identified six companies for further study in terms of socioeconomic impacts. Of the six, we did detailed studies in four of those sites. And what was good about that sample is that it was representative of, the, of, the, of our base case as a whole. We have within that four a micro, a medium, and a large and very large company. And the companies range from a Solomon Coatings uh, sock, uh, that produces coatings for um, uh, light industry, socket manufacturing, a textile plant in the Western Cape that produces a lot of these sports socks for major brands, Wallard Battery is a division of Powertech in the Eastern Cape, an automotive OEM that produces automotive uh, batteries, and, and ArcelorMittal Saldana Works, one of the ArcelorMittal, in fact, the only integrated uh, steel mill in South Africa with the Midrex and Corex. And what we did, and they ranged from companies where we had engaged in certain undertakings, and what we have seen, ranging from Socket, where a company was stifled in terms of growth because it had reached at notified maximum demand, but adopting some of the measures we've identified in our assessments, they were able to do a fuel switch from an electro to a paraffin-fired boiler. They undertook some other optimization assessments in terms of compressed air. And they were able, through that, to then reduce the notified or the maximum demand and increase the count of the number of machines and take on the additional orders that they were offered. ArcelorMittal Saldana was another case in point. In 2010, they were faced with closure. The closure of the plant and the retrenchment of its full workforce within, on the west coast of Cape Town. What happened there in 2010, when the energy manager convinced the general manager to permit her to implement an energy management system, was a saving within the first year of implementation of 60 million rand at a cost of 500,000 rand. It started a journey that today has seen that plant save in excess of 270 million rand, and they are earmarking a savings of 365 million rand by next year. That plant has now become the model for Van der Bale Park to look at improving its energy performance as well. What we have done during the in intervention was secure total direct jobs retained of 1,744. And those were total direct jobs, meaning permanent employees and permanent contractors on site. When we look at local employment created, we look at direct, indirect, and induced employment. And induced employment essentially is an estimation of consumption spending in the local area by the staff. And what we've seen there in terms of the percentage of direct employment within the area by those companies, the, that it ranged from 80%, 175%, and 78% across the four organizations. So local employment created was 5,713 within the areas for that year. Local livelihood supported. And this was based largely on the average municipal families per household ranging between 4.2 and 4.3. And we looked at total, say, total livelihood supported in the region of 3,378. Disposable earnings, and this looks at disposal, disposable earnings in, directly in the area. And when we look at what that was achieved in terms of revenue earned by workers and spent within the respective areas and the percentage of income, at ArcelorMittal that was 206 million rand, it represented 72% and 25 million rand. At Willard Batteries in the Eastern Cape it was 64 million rand, 48% and 5 million rand. And at Solomon Coatings and Socket it was 0.25 and 0.7 million rand respectively. So total disposing generated in the areas, and that's the immediate suburbs around the companies where they draw their labor from, was 271 million rand in that one year. Those, that's just a small sample and survey of what we've achieved. Another interesting outcome of the IEE project was, a, was an element that was really driven by the German Development Institute, because the focal point of the German Development Institute is the impact of behavior patterns on energy efficiency programs within developing countries. And they came over and conducted a study of what we had achieved in South Africa and elected to look at the ArcelorMittal Saldana base case. And as it stated there that you reach a point where the technology upgrades are certainly good and great, but where the distinguishing factor will be how well you manage and drive that behavior change necessary for those energy efficiency performances within your organization. Some of the behavioral insights identified extra logical means of economic actor decision making, such as bounded rationality, which refers to the limited ability of human beings to take decisions rationally, it looked at dynamic inconsistencies, the, project, the prospect theory and reference point, pro-social behavior and fairness. 
and it started to speak to the necessary and potentially low-cost component of energy management systems. In many companies, when you are faced with the barriers of some of these behavior change insights, then no cost, low cost change has become the way that you convince management and you drive and persuade management to ultimately devote and identify opportunities and devote more capex to energy efficiency projects. It becomes a key platform then to build future energy savings and it can be used either independently or in tandem with technology upgrades within your plant. And looking at the case study at Arsenal Mittel in, in, in Saldana Bay, we identified in what was done there quite a few of the barriers and the catalysts that unlocked that change. There was a lack of urgency, a lack of urgency really brought about by a lack of understanding just where they are and where they were heading. However, with the pending closure of the plant and the loss of jobs, it became a burning platform. We've seen status quo processes that really, they devolved energy to different units in the plant and it became a common burden that everybody avoided. When we looked at developing an energy management system, we started to empower and identify champions that were able to drive that both within the independent divisions but also across the plant as a whole. Low awareness skills abounded, but that was achieved through training and training became a driver of awareness skills. And beyond driving awareness skills, competency training became quite an important element. No man's land, that lack of dedicated time and financial oversight as opposed to employee engagement and management involvement. And what is critical here is that when you start empowering your employees, you develop some sort of ownership, some sort of psychological ownership. As opposed to the top-down directives that tend to, at times to generate or evoke uh, reactions of non-compliance or resistance. We, they, they appointed energy champions and energy coordinators in the plant and that really supported the program very well and created plant-wide awareness. Finance was always and is always a big obstacle to energy efficiency projects. But developing an awareness of energy savings and the importance of it and understanding of it within management is critical in unlocking that capex so necessary for the save. This is an example of what happened at Arsenal Mittel and it's an example of what I call institutional um, cultural change and it's about an esprit de, how they use this esprit de corps to enable and, 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 and develop support to save our jobs, to save the company. And what they did is they had these banners printed and, 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 and palm printed by staff across the, the range from, from operators through to senior management. They had them sign on each of the handprints and they had the commitment there that served to remind them or to show and showcase to others in the plant their commitment to driving the change in saving the company. And that was quite remarkable because it, it aligned very well to the concepts developed by the German Development Institute in terms of behavioral imperatives, and we see that there were quite a few that, that emanated from that. The value of the UNIDO and IEE uh, collaboration certainly supported that very well. The behavioral insights, and I think what we understood were that drivers do matter, and what makes people act, and what makes people change and respond, were things like ultimately product durability, was um, survival of the plant, was uh, identification with technologies, was competitiveness, competitiveness both economically and, so, and, and socially, and was the status. In, in very few cases, energy efficiency was actually a driver of that. So we looked at delegating time and financial resources, and this became an important element to the behavioral insights, is that the timing at which you pitch your CapEx demands at top management will largely depend on the success of, of achieving the funding for what is required. So, feeding back, keeping management involved, enabling a, a, a conduit of communication both up and down creates this top of mind focus where both senior management as well as the local teams down in the divisions are equally aware and understand the priorities and the importance of achieving them. Sustainability failure, we've seen this a lot. We've seen plants start with us and adopt this and run like fire and after six months peter out. And at the end of that period, they've virtually have regressed to a point where we need to start again. We are now finding large national groups engage the project to start from scratch because in 2010, they did not sustain the commitment that was started at that time. And in our lessons in South Africa, there are quite a few things that talk about and speak to the winning culture. We need top management to be visible and to be part of the process. It should be a top management, it should be both a top-down and a bottoms-up approach. 
Um, World-class manufacturing environments are really great, and we've seen that at many of our large plants, in that they provide the stable information and the stable inputs, the optimization opportunities, and the controls that are so necessary in energy management systems. There must also be a willingness that after you've exhausted all the no-cost uh, projects that you need to start spending money. Stability and reliability is key both from a maintenance point of view, from a labor point of view, and from a financial point of view. Adequate sub-metering, I've mentioned before, allocation of resources are critical. These are some of the beneficiaries that have worked with the IE project and have benefited through the IE project. We have seen over the years that South Africa today can boast of nine organizations that are ISO 50001 certified, and of those nine, the IE project had a direct hand in seven in terms of capacitating them and preparing them for certification. I think it's important for me to say as we enter the last slide that phase two lies ahead. Based on what we've achieved in South Africa in phase one, we will see a, a project infinitely larger in terms of both budget, but also in terms of target. Gender mainstreaming and gender equality becomes a very large and important KPI within phase two. Phase two, it's a four-year project and it ends in 2019. So I invite you all to watch the space. Thank you very much.